This is a test. This is a test.
Good afternoon. Welcome back. And I think we are back also with those online that were struggling a little bit this morning, but we, we, we have like a, a blessing and a <laughs> um, we reviewed everything. So I hope we are now online, uh, all theologians and some part of the faculty and the staff. So Christo Dr. Christopher Kaiser will give us now this uh, lecture on Adam and Eve, what Genesis really means. So please welcome Dr. Kaiser. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for coming back to uh, hear me again. Uh, that's nice. Uh, I've been looking for these lectures uh, for quite a while because as was said in the earlier introduction, uh, this is the third time I've tried to give these lectures. We had it canceled and canceled again. So it's very nice to be here and it's, it's fun to, after you look forward to something, to actually have it happen. And it reminds me of uh, when I got an email from the Vatican this was maybe eight years ago or something. I got an email from the Vatican, and it said, uh, you know, would you like to be a member of the Pontifical Academy for Life? And part of this involves that you get to have an audience with uh, Pope Francis. And I wrote back, of course, and I said, well, that would be wonderful. I'd love to be a member of the Pontifical Academy for Life, and to meet Pope Francis is great. And I said, well, there are different kinds of audiences, though, right? So some kinds of audiences is, you know, Pope Francis is here, and there's 800 people, and you're like in the back row, and you know, it's an audience. And I said, well, what kind of audience is this? He said, well, this is the kind of audience where you actually get to shake the Pope's hand and talk to him a little bit. So I thought, wow, this is like a, a terrific. And so I started to think right away about, well, what am I going to say when I meet the Holy Father? And the first thing I thought of was, well, you know, I don't speak Italian, unfortunately, and I also don't speak Spanish, unfortunately. And so I've heard that the Holy Father, those are his main languages. And I thought, well, I won't be able to you know, say anything in those languages. And then I heard that he doesn't know English that well. So I thought, well, I can't talk to him in English. So I said, well, he studied in Germany for two years. And I studied in Germany for two years. So I said, I'll, I'll try my German on him. And then hopefully we'll have a little conversation. And then I thought a lot, OK, what am I going to say to say something kind of memorable, kind of help us to have a, you know, a good conversation and stuff? So, uh, so I think about a lot. I go, okay, I know what I'll say. I'll say, Holy Father, would you please pray for my family and my university? And I thought, well, maybe he'll follow up like, oh, what, what university? Or is there a problem with your family? And I thought, this is great. I got a perfect, perfect thing to say to the Holy Father. <laughs> so um, there's this kind of receiving line. It's a little bit like Holy Communion. So someone goes up there and shakes his hand, talks to him. And the person in front of me is up there talking to the Holy Father. Conversation and shaking. Everything's great. I thought, this is great. And the guy steps aside. Now it's my turn. So I walk up to him. And there he is, the Holy Father. I think to myself, he looks just like he does in pictures. Now, okay. And I stick out my hand and I say, in English, nice to meet you. <laughs> that, that was it. No. <laughs> so anyway, that, that didn't give him much to work with. So I, it didn't work out so well. But anyway, um, but thank goodness I'm here. And I want to talk to you guys about arguably the most interesting story in the world. And the reason I say it may be the most interesting story in the world, and certainly it's one of the most interesting stories in the world, is that the older a story is, the more likely that that story has perennial lasting value. Because think about it, if a story is not classic, if it's not amazing, people just don't bother to retell it, right? I mean, do any of you think, you know, 200 years from now, people will be looking at the, um, the television script of an episode of Friends and like going through it and like debating it and talking about it. No, I mean, it, it'll be completely forgotten and you know, no one will care about it and it will just be gone, right? But not just for 200 years, not just for 2,000 years, but even longer, people have been talking about, debating, and telling the story of creation. So it is literally one of the oldest stories in the world. And it is a story that has had unbelievable influence from its very beginnings all the way to now. And so I'm going to tell you exactly what Genesis means. No, that's not true. I'm going to give you one interpretation of Genesis, my interpretation. And it is only one. There are so many different interpretations of Genesis from greater thinkers than I am, Augustine, Aquinas, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to give you my understanding of the story. And I hope that you can correct me and help me understand it better because I talk about this story very often with my classes, and so I hope I can get a deeper understanding of Genesis. 
perhaps through your questions and your objections. And I'm particularly interested in our uh, experts in scripture who will be able to tell me definitively, you're totally wrong. Uh, and that'll be great. I'll learn something new. So let's talk about Genesis a little bit. Um, the word gift, the word gift, what does that mean? Well, we're in the United States, and I am a native English speaker, and everyone here, I think, is fluent in English. And so if I say the word gift, you probably naturally think of presents, right? What you get on your birthday, what you get for Christmas, etc. But the very same word, spelled the very same way, means poison in German. So if we were giving this lecture in the University of Cologne and I was a professor from uh, you know, some German university and you were all German-speaking students and I said the word gift, you would naturally think of poison. So how do you know if I say the word gift if I'm talking about a present or if I'm talking about poison? Well, you know from the context, right? We're English speakers and you know, I'm giving this whole talk in English, so probably if I say the word gift, I'm talking about a, a present. But the same thing's true not of only of a word, but of a whole sentence. So let's say we're really good friends, and we're uh, joking around, having a conversation, and you're drinking a beer, I'm drinking a beer, and accidentally you spill your beer on this beautiful tie that someone lent me. So if you did, if you did that to me, I might say to you, I'm going to kill you. And you might laugh, and I laugh, and that's it. And you understand from the context that if I say, I'm going to kill you, I'm joking. I'm not like making an actual threat on your life. It's clear, right? We're friends. I'm laughing. You're laughing. There's no hostile intent. By contrast, if you're walking out to your car at 1.30 in the morning and a person in a Hell's Angels outfit comes out from the, the shadows with a switchblade and says, I'm going to kill you, the context indicates that this is a real threat against your life. Now, the same thing that's true of a word and the same thing that's true of a uh, line is also true of a story. If we want to understand Genesis, we need to understand Genesis in its context. And the context of the original author of Genesis and the original readers of Genesis is not contemporary discussions about evolution. The original author of Genesis knew nothing about evolution. The original readers of Genesis did not have evolution on their radar. And so to read Genesis as if it's for or against evolution makes about as much sense as to read Genesis as if it's for or against iPhones, right? They're just, the original author of Genesis just didn't know anything about iPhones, and neither did the original readers of Genesis. It's just not about iPhones. So if I study Genesis really carefully and say, well, should I buy an iPhone, should I not? I mean, I can ask that question, but that question really doesn't make much sense, right? In other words, it's highly likely the text of Genesis just doesn't address that question. And I think it's highly likely the text of Genesis actually, when read in its context, doesn't even address pro or con evolution. It's just not about that. So what is it about? Well, if we look at the original context, most scholars believe that Genesis was written in dialogue with other stories of creation. For instance, the Babylonian story of creation. And in these rival stories of creation, this is true of the Babylonian stories of creation, it's true of the Greek stories of creation, it's true of the Egyptian stories of creation, these stories go something like this. There's variations, of course, but the basic idea is this. In the beginning, there was a war among the gods, and the gods fought each other, and there was a cosmic battle, and out of this war and out of this battle arose the universe as we now know it. And Genesis is written as a rival story to those stories, and so I think we can really understand more deeply what Genesis is really talking about if we put Genesis in dialogue with these other stories. So, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All right, so look at what is missing. There is no cosmic battle. There are no rival gods. In fact, what you have is only one God, and the one God is showing a kind of absolute sovereignty over what? Over the heavens and the earth. I think that's another way of saying over the things here below, the things we can see, the everyday things of life, and the things above, the things that are beyond us, the things we don't see, the transcendent dimensions of life. These things are created not through violence, but through the action of God. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, 
and the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. So Genesis in this passage and in many other passages too, I think is using uh, language in a very poetic and richly uh, imaginative sort of way. So the images and the feeling of it and the poetry of it I think are important here. And as I read these words, what I read is actually just the opposite of violence. This is a peaceful situation, but it's an incomplete situation, right? Because the earth is lacking something, it's without form. And there's darkness, and there's a void, there's some sort of lack. And so what we see is this initial description of how things are as incomplete and lacking certain things is going to be remedied by God. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. So how does God create? Not through violence, not through overcoming a rival God, but rather through rational speech. And this is a theme that Jordan Peterson helped me understand, because I never, I heard this line of course before, but I never really understood the significance of this. But to create something through rational speech, what does that indicate? Well, if you think about what speech is, what differentiates speech from just making sounds, is that there's an intelligibility to speech. In other words, if I just started squawking or making noises, you wouldn't understand the meaning of any of the things I'm saying. But if I speak rationally, you can understand the meaning. There's intelligibility to each word. And rational speech is rational because there's an order. There's a grammatical order, there's a linguistic order, and you can understand that order if you're a speaker of that language. And in order for me to create rational speech, what do I have to be? I have to be rational. Right? A bird can't make rational speech because it's not a rational being. I can make rational speech because I am a rational being. So what this text is saying is that the ultimate principle of the universe, God, is a rational being. And that the universe is a result of his reasonable, rational, intelligible intervention. God says, let there be light, and there is light. So you have a God that's reasonable, using reasonable speech to create an orderly, reasonable creation. And that's extremely important, because if creation is not orderly and reasonable, then science is impossible. The, the reason science is able to get off the ground is that, in fact, creation is intelligible. Creation is reasonable. Scientists can discover the order that is in nature. And the reason scientists began to study this originally in the 17th century is that they all believed that creation was orderly and reasonable and intelligible. And that's what led them to begin to do science because they assumed correctly that God is reasonable and orderly. And so nature reflects who God is. And therefore you can discover an order in nature. And the early scientists set out to discover that order in nature. By contrast, if you really thought that the universe was just chaos, that the universe was a random battlefield, well then, it wouldn't make sense to try to discover the order in nature. I mean, think about it. Imagine that, say, everyone on this side of the room got into a huge fight with everyone on this side of the room, and it was a huge battle. And then after we were done fighting, people came in here and tried to figure out, well, what's the order here in this room? Well, there would be no order in this room, right? There'd be chairs knocked over, and someone's tooth over here, and blood here, and it just would be a total mess, right? There's no order in it at all. Right? So if you think the universe is chaotic and just a disorderly mess as a result of a cosmic battle, well, you wouldn't bother to begin to try to do science because you think, well, there's nothing to study. There's no order here at all. So Genesis is not science in the contemporary sense, but Genesis lays the groundwork for science in the contemporary sense. And that's why science arose when and where it did. It arose in the West with everyone who started doing science having agreed upon view about the universe as orderly. God saw that the light was good. We can read over this uh, line and not appreciate its novelty. In the ancient world, in many stories, creation is not seen as good. Among any, many of these ancient stories, creation or the world was seen, the material world in particular, was seen as something bad. Many of these had a dualistic view of the world, where what was good was the spirit, and what was bad was the material, the flesh and blood. And here we'll see the first time in Genesis that God says it's good. 
And this is, line is repeated throughout. God says, this is good, and that's good, and that's good. And then sometimes God says, when he creates human beings, it was very good. The goodness of creation is something that is distinctive about this story in relationship to the other stories, and especially the goodness of us, the goodness of us as flesh and blood. Because again, many rival stories thought of us as good only insofar as we were a spirit, but then we were trapped in the prison of our body. And the body, this stuff was, this is really not good at all. And God separated the light from the darkness. God separates the light from the darkness. You have not only creation, in other words, you have an order. God establishes an order in creation, right? Not just that things are made, but things are separated and put in their proper place, in a proper order. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. So God calls the things he creates. He names things. That's part of who God is. So you have the word giving rise to things, and now you have the word categorizing things. And we're made in God's image, and the same thing is true of us, right? We use our words to categorize things, and we name things, and that allows us to better understand things. And you have day, and you have night, and you have one day. Now, some interpreters read this in a very unintelligent way. And they say, okay, we've got one day now, and then we've got another day later, we've got another day, and then we've got six days of creation. But I know that uh, science tells us that the whole universe evolved over billions of years. And science tells us that the whole universe is about 13.8 billion years old. So here you have this, these stupid people thinking, oh, there's just six days and everything was done in six 24-hour periods. I think this is not a very intelligent reading of the text, in part because the original language, as in English, can mean day either to mean 24 hours, which sometimes it does, or to mean just an indiscriminate period of time. So for instance, if I say to you, in my day, when I was in high school, nobody had cell phones. Now, no intelligent person thinks I'm claiming that I went through high school in 24 hours, right? I mean, you know, when I say in my day, I just mean, you know, back at that time or something, right? I'm not making a claim about 24 hours or something. But I think the same thing is true in this text. The Bible elsewhere uses day, yes, sometimes it's 24 hours, but often in the more indeterminate sense that it's used, I think, in this text. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. So again, we as contemporary readers can, can read over this and just say, oh yeah, God made the sun and the stars and okay. But in the ancient world, this was an important claim. And it was very important because in the ancient world, many, many different kinds of ancient peoples worshipped the sun, worshipped the moon, worshipped the stars as divine. They thought of these things as gods. And Genesis is pushing back on this idea and saying these things are not divine. These things are not gods. These things are made by God just like everything else is made by God. And even today, you have people that think that the sun and the moon and the stars somehow govern their lives. I mean, do you meet people, I suppose, that say, hi, I'm a Leo, what are you? And, you know, when people ask you those sorts of things, it seems like they're expressing a belief in astrology, that somehow they think this is a significant, you know, uh, you know bit of information about you, that you are a Leo or a Cancer or a Sagittarius or whatever else. And with those people, I say to them, okay, so let me get this straight. Um, you think that you are going to be different than other people because you're a Leo, say. Yeah, yeah, of course I am. I've got this characteristic, that characteristic. Great. So how many people do you think were born on your birthday? Right? There's about 8 billion people on the planet. You know, divide that by 365 days a year, roughly. Right? You have millions of people born on your birthday. And are all those millions and millions of people, are they exactly like you? Same temperament, same fate, same results in life? Of course not. Right? And yet, somehow, in our so-called rational age, we have all these people who still follow astrology and, and think the stars and the moon, and they're somehow guiding and governing their lives. It's kind of funny. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 
So this line, I think, is one of the most important in the whole Bible, in part because this idea of man being made in the image of God is a revolutionary idea. So it was not revolutionary in the ancient world to have the king be in the image of God, and maybe the king's son in the image of God. But here it's not saying just the king or just the king's son, right? This is saying all of us. And note, it's not just saying men are made in the image of God. It's saying women are made in the image of God. That too is revolutionary. Every single human being being in the image and likeness of God. This idea was so important that centuries later, after the Second World War, it led to the idea that there's universal human rights. The idea that every single human being, regardless of age, cult, religion, culture, political views, health condition, regardless of anything, every single human being deserves basic respect. Now, I'm not sure our culture would have ever gotten to that point if it weren't for the influence of this text, saying that every single individual is made in the image and likeness of God. Or to put it differently, nobody is a nobody. Nobody is a nobody. And that's why part of our Catholic tradition is to reach out in particular to those people that some other people might think are nobodies. Right? Why should we care for the hungry and the thirsty and the homeless? Well, Jesus said, I am taken care of when you care for those people. Right? Jesus highlighted, you might say, in his own actions and his own teaching, the importance of this passage. Right? That everybody counts. Every single human being is valuable because made by God, because in God's image. And what does it mean to be made in God's image? Well, God is not a material body, and therefore God isn't male or female because God doesn't have a body, therefore God can't have a male body or a female body. But what is it to be in God's image? Well, we've seen already, what does God do? God has rational speech, so God is reasonable. God chooses to create. His hand's not forced by some cosmic battle. He chooses to create. And so we, and he names things. He has reason and rationality. And we too have those powers, right? We're able to reason. And because we're able to reason, we're able to choose freely. It's precisely our reason that enables us to have free choice. Because any earthly thing that I may want to choose, I can consider either as good or as not good. So take the water. I can say, well, the water is good because it keeps me from getting dehydrated. I can say drinking water now is not good because it'll interrupt my sentence that I'm about to say. And that's true of every single earthly act we do. Our reason enables us to be free, right? If I were a dog or a cat, I just would drink or not drink based on instinct, right? But as a human being, what I can do is get distance from whatever instincts I have to drink or not drink, let's say, and consider it in terms of reason and consider, okay, well, is this really a good thing or really not a good thing? Should I choose this or should I not choose it? And I can weigh up the pros and cons and then they can make a choice. So God has this reason. And Aquinas thought God also had freedom. He thought that the world could have been different than it was. He thought that the world didn't have to be at all, that God freely chose to create the world and that God freely chose to create the world as he created it. So for instance, do you have a twin brother? I was pointing at him. You don't, okay. So you have no twin brother. On Aquinas' view, at least, you could have had a twin brother. And you do have a twin brother. But do you, are you one of triplets? Okay, so you don't have a, another twin brother, another triplet brother. But that could have been, right? It could have been that there weren't just twins, there were triplets. So the world could have been radically different than it is, on Aquinas' view. And God chose to create this world, rather than the world in which you had a twin brother, you had a another brother as a triplet, etc. So God creates with this freedom. And to say that we're made in God's image means that we're rational, that we are free, that we are like God. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. So God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. This passage is pointing to something also that's very important. In the ancient world, some people thought that the human body was basically a prison that held the soul, 
and that therefore the human body, the matter, was sort of evil and bad. And therefore they thought it's really bad to have children because having children encaptures in matter more of the good spirit. And we want the good spirit not to be in matter. So to have children was seen as problematic and bad. But Genesis is teaching us a different lesson, not the lesson that everyone needs to have kids. No, some people are called not to have kids. But having children is nevertheless a great blessing. I mean, think about it this way. If it's true that something's valuable, like gold, well, then a gold mine would be valuable, right? If cash is valuable, a lucrative career is valuable. So this text is teaching us to, that to be fruitful, to procreate, is a good thing. Why? Because you and I are good things, right? We're valuable. So it is a valuable thing to procreate. Again, not like everyone needs to procreate. In fact, in a way, to be a priest or to be a sister is a way of procreating, obviously in a, not a physical way, but in, in a spiritual way that's more radical than the procreation I do as a human father. So as a, as a married man and as a father, I have a special duty and obligation to love my own wife and to love my own children. And as a family man, I have a duty and responsibility to put their well-being ahead of other people. So I should love my family more than I love kids in the neighborhood. And I should love my children more than I love my students, say. But a priest or a sister has, uh, doesn't have a, a spouse, doesn't have children, and so potentially everyone is that person's son or daughter. And therefore, their love is much more radical than my love, which is so focused and particularized. They're able to go wherever the need is greatest. So I have a Jesuit friend. Our lives were similar in a way. He was a philosophy professor teaching classes, same as me. And then one day he got the mission to go to Africa. So that's where he went, and I you know, emailed with him, and he goes, well, things are really different here. Oh, how so? Well, sometimes you know, the electricity is off for you know, a few days at a time. Jeez. And sometimes you know, we don't really get food, so we gotta kinda not really have food for a few days. Oh my gosh, really? Yeah, there's a, kind of a war-torn area, and so the food you know, would be interrupted, and, they, and sometimes the water would be turned off. And I thought to myself, I could never do that. I couldn't say to my wife and kids, hey, kids, we're moving to Africa. You know, electricity is spotty. And sometimes we don't have water. Uh, you know, it's, it's all good. Come on, let's go. Of course they can't do that, right? But he could. He had a kind of openness to a really radical kind of love that I can't have. It would be wrong for me to drag my wife and kids to a, ter a place like that. It's so, you know, so difficult. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So what is this idea of dominion? I think the idea is a kind of middle ground between, on the one hand, domination, and on the other hand, a sort of subjugation of human beings to nature. So what is a domination view? Well, that would be that the natural world is just ours to use however we want. We can exploit it, we can ruin it, it doesn't matter, right? It's just a tool, it's like a nail or something and a hammer. We just do whatever we want with it. On the other hand, you have the radical environmentalist types who say, well, the world would be better off if we just got rid of all people, right? We should never have children, and it would be great if humanity just were to die, because then the natural world would flourish. And so the text of Genesis is giving us a kind of middle, middle path. You might call it stewardship, where on the one hand, you don't have domination of nature, exploitation of nature. On the other hand, you don't worship nature as if it's divine, because the text is teaching us, after all, that the sun, moon, stars, and earth are not divine, but rather are created things, and that human beings do have a priority in nature. There is an order to creation, such that if I need to chop down a tree in order to survive, or I need to hunt animals or chop down plants in order to survive, that's okay for me to do. But again, that's different than exploitation. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. All right, it was very good. So again, the text, the, the distinctiveness of this text may evade us, because it has been so influential that we don't even see the alternative very well. But the alternative view would be this, that the material order is not good, that you, we as human beings are not good, that our bodies are not good, that we should never have children. All these are alternative views that were very common in the ancient world, that the only good is the spiritual. Right? Think of the Socratic view that we are souls imprisoned in bodies. 
Socrates, at the end of his life, rejoiced to drink the hemlock because he said, well, I'm finally going to be free of this terrible body that's holding me down and imprisoning me. But the view of Augustine and Aquinas and the Catholic tradition generally is that we're not souls trapped in bodies, but that our bodies are good. And that's why at the end of time, there's the resurrection of the body. If our bodies were bad, it would not be a good thing to resurrect them, right? If our bodies were bad, God would say, oh, great, your soul's here. Thank goodness you're free of that terrible prison of your body. We'll just let it go. But that's not the Catholic view, right? Our bodies are good. And precisely for that reason, we should love ourselves properly and take care of our bodies. If our bodies are good, if our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that seems to enjoin on us a responsibility to care for ourselves, right? To get enough exercise, to eat well, to do all the things we need to do to have a healthy body, right? Not because the body is a god or the body is the most important thing. It's not the most important thing. But because we're embodied creatures, we can't even love God properly. We can't love others properly. And we won't love ourselves properly unless we take due care of our bodily well-being. The seventh day, God finished his work, which he had done. So I call your attention to this sort of outline, which I draw from Scott Hahn's book, um, A Father Who Keeps His Promises. And he notes that on, you have the emptiness and formlessness spoken of at the very beginning of Genesis um, taken away by realms and rulers. So you have the formlessness taken away first by time. You have day and night established initially. And then you have space established through sea and sky. And then you have life established with land and vegetations. So the formlessness that is spoken of in the beginning is taken away by various realms. And then you have the emptiness taken away. So you have the sun, moon, and stars taking away the emptiness of day and night. You have the birds and the fish ruling over the sea and the sky. And then finally, you have human beings and animals that rule over the land and the vegetation. So the picture of Genesis, in other words, is of an orderly creation. It's, of, as it were, a cosmic temple, a cosmic house, where everything is in its proper order. And what is this idea of the seventh day? Well, it can't be that God, who creates everything, all time, all space, and all matter, is just wiped out. Right? It's Sunday. He's so tired. He's just, you know, he has to watch some football. He's just totally tired. He can't, he's wiped out. Well, that doesn't make any sense of the text if God is really God. So what is this seventh day? Well, Han points out, he argues, that this word for seven also means to make a covenant. And so the idea is that God is in a relationship with creation. This is, again, a kind of corrective to the deistic view that God makes the world and just lets it go. The idea that God is like a watchmaker, right? That the Rolex company makes a watch, you know, it's sold and it's off. And for all we know, the Rolex company goes out of business or the factory was made, is bombed, or who knows. But the watch just continues on its own. This is saying, no, 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 God is in an ongoing relationship with all of creation. And this makes sense in terms of God being love. If we think of God as love, what does love do? Love wills the good for the other. So God's love is reflected in creation. It's God's love that is the, what would you say, the foundation of the sun and the moon and the stars and the fish and the birds. Right? As Hopkins talked about, um, that creation's charged with the grandeur of God. All creation is. Or as Ignatius of Loyola talked about, that we can find God in all things. And this is sometimes misunderstood as if God were atoms or something. Well, it's not that God is in all things the way atoms are in my body, right? But rather, God is in all things, you might say, similar in a way to the way Shakespeare is in the play Romeo and Juliet. Shakespeare is behind the whole thing. But different than that, because unlike Romeo and Juliet, which can still exist without Shakespeare's ongoing contribution, the sun, moon, the stars, and you and me depend on our continued existence on God. That is to say, it's not just that God makes us and lets us go and we're spinning off on our own without God's help anymore, but that right now, I only continue to exist because of God. I mean, here's one way to think of it. Right now, all of us only exist, right, because the temperature is within a certain parameter, right? If it got super hot like on the sun, we would all die. If it got super cold like the North Pole, we would also all die. So the only reason we continue to exist is the temperature is within a certain parameter, right? And then what causes temperature? Well, we could spin out a tale of what causes this, what causes that, right? We're also kept alive by what? Atmospheric pressure, 
right? If we were at the bottom of the ocean without a submarine, we'd all be crushed. If we're out in outer space with no spacesuit, we would also die. Just like a fish taken up from the bottom of the ocean, when it gets to the surface, dies, right? Its eyes pop out of its head because the atmospheric pressure is so radically different than it is at the bottom of the ocean. So we're kept alive right now. We would immediately die if the atmospheric pressure were to radically change. And atmospheric pressure is getting caused by what? Well, by temperature in part. And temperature itself is getting caused. And if we trace this causality back, there has to be some uncaused cause that is now causing everything to exist. Not 13.8 billion years ago, now causing everything to exist. And if that were taken away, we would cease to exist. That is to say, if you get rid of atmospheric pressure, if you get rid of the temperature being with the certain rains, again, we immediately cease to exist. So our continued existence depends ultimately on God. That's a philosophical way of thinking of this theological idea that God is in this seventh-day relationship with creation. God is in an ongoing relationship with creation. The Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So this is a terrific, terrific passage, and I've accompanied it with a terrific picture. This is, of course, Michelangelo's depiction of creation found in the Sistine Chapel on the ceiling. And if you've never been there, I hope before you die, you do have a chance to go there, because you really should see this with your own eyes. The image is depicting God the Father reaching out to Adam, and you see Adam with a kind of weak, barely engaged kind of, uh, kind of finger, and God much more energetic and lively, kind of giving him, giving him life. And this passage in Genesis is teaching us something incredibly important, and it's using beautiful poetic imagery to teach us that. There are some people who think all human beings are as dust. All we are is matter. You're just a bunch of chemicals. That's it. But then there's other people who have the opposite kind of view, and they say all you are is spirit. You're a ghost in the machine. And this body stuff, that's not you. This is like a car you're riding around, and that's not the real you. The real you is spirit. Or maybe you're a uh, brainstem or something. But this, that's not you. That's just your body. But this is teaching us, no, 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 what we are as human beings is not just pure matter, not just the dust from the ground, but also not just the breath of life, not just the spirit, not just the soul. What you are and what I are is a composite, a unity. And if we were just a body or just a soul, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be us. We wouldn't be, I wouldn't be myself if I were just one or just the other. And in fact, that's what happens at death, right? At death, body and soul separate. And you have two things left over. Everyone agrees you have the body left over, you have the corpse. But the corpse is not really you, right? That's kind of a remainder of you, something left over from your death. But likewise, Aquinas said the soul is not really you. And the soul is something left over. But that's not really you. And you might say, well, why should I think there's such a thing as a soul? Well, Aquinas had an interesting argument for this, and I'll, I don't know what you guys think of it, but I'll run it by you and see what you think. Aquinas thought about the soul as immaterial. And the reason he thought it was immaterial is that he thought that to know something means to have a unity between the thing known and the knower. So if you contrast, say, us with a dog, what's the difference? Well, one of the differences is that, is that dogs share with us sense perceptions, but they don't share knowledge with us. And what does that mean? Well, what that means, you can illustrate it by means of thinking about a dog looking at steam a dog interacting with water, and a dog interacting with ice. Now, a dog is going to think or sense that ice and steam are just totally different things. One is hard, one is soft. One is cold, one is hot. And in the dog's mind, these are just totally separate things. But we as human beings can transcend our sense understanding, and we can know intellectually that, no, 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 even though they look very different, they feel very different, in fact, really, Ice and steam actually are the same thing. They're H2O, both of them, and water too. And when we know something like that, what that means is there's a unity between our minds and reality. That is to say that my mind apprehends and receives, uh, Aquinas would call it, the form that exists in H2O, and I, there's a unity between me and that. But the unity is not a material unity. That is to say, when I know... Um, an elephant, I don't get heavier. If I know water, I don't get wet. And yet there's a real unity between my mind and these realities. 
But for there to be a real unity between me and these realities, if it's not a material unity, what is it? Well, it's a non-material unity. But if I'm only a material being, how could I have a non-material unity with something else? So there must be some part of me that's immaterial. And if it's immaterial, that means it's not composed, it's not bodily. And that means that it can't be decomposed. So Aquinas thought of the human soul as not subject to dying. And yet, he also thought that the soul wasn't me. The real me is this unity of body and soul. So at death, what happens again? There's something left over the corpse, and there's something left over the soul. But neither one of those is really me. And that's why only at the resurrection am I constituted again. Only then do I really have the fullness of life, on Aquinas' view. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. So man is made in the image of God, and God works. We just saw that. God creates all these things over the seven days, six days, and human beings also have a job. And you notice all this is before the sin, before the serpent comes in. It is, you might say, the vocation of the human person to work. And the reason for that is it's in the vocation of the human person to love. If I love other people, how am I going to serve them? Well, part of love might be to say nice things to them. Yeah, that's true. And part of love might be to refrain from harming them and not punch them in the face. Yeah, that's true too. But if I really love people, I want to make their lives and I want to make the world better. And how do I do that? I do that through work, right? The gardener tries to make the garden a little better. The teacher tries to make the students a little better. The person doing the electricity tries to hook up things so the lights work a little better. Real work, legitimate work at least, is aimed at something good, providing a good or service for other people that they need or that they want. And so this is the human vocation. This is not the result of sin or punishment and God gets us in trouble, now we have to work. No, no, this is part of a, the original nature of human beings. Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall die. All right, what does this mean? This is a mysterious passage, I think. So let's focus on this part of it, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So if I say to you, I know the United States from the tip of Alaska to Florida, from Hawaii to Maine, that would be another way of me saying, I know the United States completely. Or if I say to you, I know philosophy from the pre-Socratics to Alastair McIntyre. I know the whole history of philosophy. That's another way of saying I have complete knowledge of philosophy. So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what is that saying? Well, that's saying I have knowledge from one extreme of good all the way to the other extreme of evil. And who has that kind of complete knowledge? God. Right? So what is God warning here? God is saying, don't try to become God. And you might say, well, who would try to become God? Well, the atheistic philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre said that man is the desire to be God. He thought everybody wanted to be God. Why? Well, isn't it true everybody wants to run things according to their desires? Isn't it true that everybody likes to be in charge of things? and to have things go the way they want. And so this desire to be God, this desire to not uh, just follow what's good and what's evil, but to create what is good and what's evil for yourself, this seems to be a fairly uh, distinctive part of the human condition. I mean, think about the United States Supreme Court, right? They said that at the heart of liberty is your ability to create meaning, creation, and ultimate human destiny for yourself, right? The famous Planned Parenthood versus Casey decision, right? They're talking about this, right? They might as well say, we want to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I mean, that's what they're talking about. Now, what's the problem with this? Why would God forbid this? Why would God say, don't try to become God? Well, there is a good reason. Imagine you try to become a dog, right? And you really try. So you get on all fours, and you eat dog food, and you chase around the way a dog would do. You could do that, right? But what would happen to you if you did that? Well, if you tried to become a dog, you would lose out on, for instance, human friendships, because you wouldn't do that. You'd lose out on human knowledge. You would never read a book again. 
you would lose out on going to movies and doing all the distinctly human things that you probably enjoy doing. You would lose out on all those things. You would really ruin your life, right, if you tried to become a dog. And imagine you took it even further, right? You, you um, yeah, went to the dog park. I mean, you can imagine your whole life would be destroyed, right? <laughs> but the same thing's true of becoming God. And in fact, it's even harder for you to become God, at least you and a dog are both animals, but to become God, that's, that's even more impossible than for you to become a dog. And so what happens if you try to become God? Well, for one thing, you ruin your own life. But for another thing, people who try to become God often ruin other people's lives, right? Think of all the tyrants throughout history that wanted absolute power, wanted absolute obedience. What is that other than the desire to be God? You should not have absolute obedience for anyone except for God, because only God knows everything, right? No human being knows everything, right? But isn't it true that if we look at history, so many people have, in effect, tried to become God. They want absolute obedience. They want to command everyone. They act as if they know everything. They act as if other people are just pawns in their little game. It's very, very problematic to try to become God for your own well-being and for the well-being of others. So the text of Genesis is warning us in a very poetic and beautiful way, don't try to become God. Don't think that you create good and evil for yourself. It's not going to end well. The man gave names to all, to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every beast of the field. So see how human, the human person is in the image of God. God names the sun and the moon and the stars and the trees, etc. Now the human being is naming things. For the man, there was not found a helper fit for him. So Adam's looking around at all the animals. And yeah, zebras are great, but not really quite quite a good partner for me. And, you know, you see all these different things. There's, there's, a, there's a, something missing. And so what does God do? So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. So God creates Eve from the rib of Adam. And some people have interpreted this as, as a kind of anti-woman story. But what Aquinas said is this. He said, God did not make Eve from the head of Adam to be his commander. God did not make Eve from the foot of Adam to be his slave. God made Eve from the rib of Adam to be his companion. And this creation from Adam is important for another reason. Many other ancient stories of creation held that men and women came from totally different locations. For instance, think of the story you may have read of Aristophanes. He has a story in, uh, or Plato's symposium has the speech of Aristophanes. And in this speech, he says, some people are made from the sun, some people are made from the earth, some people are made from the uh, moon. And so you have basically human beings coming from these three different locations. This is saying, no, 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 all human beings are ultimately from Adam, right? Because Eve comes from Adam's rib. And what does that mean? That means that man and woman share equally in human nature, right? Men are not more human than women. Women are not more human than men. We share equally in human nature. And moreover, according to the story, all human beings arise and come from this union of Adam and Eve. But that's an extremely important claim, because if that's true, what that means is all of us ultimately are brothers and sisters in one human family. All of us are. If we took that idea seriously, if we really treated all of us as part of one human family, all of us as distant relatives in, in one family, what a difference that would make for how we treated other people. And that's what this text is saying, I think. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. So it's God who unifies man and woman. For us as Catholics, that unity finds a beautiful expression in marriage, right? That God is the author of marriage. Marriage is a natural human institution, but even that is made by God, according to this text. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. 
she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So remember, they're both naked. And what does Adam say? He immediately comments on her body, right? This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He finds her beautiful. He's impressed. He likes what he sees. And this is important too, because in some ancient stories, the idea of attraction between men and women was seen as bad. It was seen as something, something of the fall. Again, to contrast Genesis with the story that Plato tells in the symposium, the speech of Aristophanes, Aristophanes held that the attraction between the sexes only arose as a punishment of the gods. That we wouldn't have that if it weren't for a wrong, human wrongdoing and divine punishment. This text, I think, is suggesting something else that it's natural and normal and healthy and nothing wrong with it at all, that a man is attracted to a woman or a woman is attracted to the man. That's not a result of the fall. It's not in itself a sin. There's nothing wrong with that at all. It's part of the order of creation, the good order of creation. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and cleaves to his wife, and they become one flesh. All right, we have the first marital advice, and it's very good marital advice. For a man like me who's married, I should prefer my wife to my mom. And I love my mom like crazy. My mom's terrific, but I should love my wife even more, right? I need to leave my father and no longer be under his authority. I respect my dad like crazy, and I do listen to him when he tells me something because he's really smart, a lot smarter than I am in many, many things. But still, the new unity, the new key relationship is not with my parents anymore as a married man, but with my wife and I should cleave to her, and I should become one flesh with her. The text of Genesis is showing here great practical wisdom. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So they're naked, and to be naked in front of someone is to feel totally comfortable with them, right? You would not be naked in front of someone that was threatening you, someone that you were worried about. To be naked is a way of talking about a total unity a total ease, a comfort, a harmony between man and woman. And that's what they had, right? They weren't ashamed. They didn't have to hide. They didn't have to cover up. They didn't feel that they were going to be judged. They were in perfect harmony. They were at ease with each other. They had, in other words, a wonderful relationship. Things were just the way they should be between man and woman. Now the serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. All right, things are going to change, right? We have now the serpent introduced. And I love how Michelangelo depicts this as this long serpent tail, you know, weaving up this tree, right? Sometimes the serpent's depicted as like a little tiny, you know, gardener snake or something, just a little thing. But I think this is, I think this is better, right? The serpent is scary, this is like an anaconda or something. It's going to, you know, grab you and tie you up and, and strangle you. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? So look at how the serpent twists what God said. I mean, God said you could eat of any tree in the garden except for one. And here he's saying, oh, did God say you couldn't eat of any tree of the garden? Are all the trees forbidden to you? And isn't this exactly what the serpent says to us? You mean God for, said you shouldn't do that? Oh, he's trying to ruin your fun. He's really getting in the way. Wow, he, he's not on your side. I'm on your side. Do what I say, right? Don't follow God. He's trying to ruin your fun. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. All right. So Eve seems to slightly restate or misstate what, what God actually commanded. That's interesting. So it seems as if maybe she hasn't fully accepted or understood what God was saying. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die. So there's a picture here of a Komodo dragon, an intimidating, ferocious, dangerous, deadly kind of serpent. And Scott Hahn, at least, thinks that this is a better way of understanding the serpent in the garden. Again, not as a little gardener snake, but as a ferocious, deadly kind of predator. 
And so the serpent says to the woman, you will not die. And what's going on there? Well, he thinks that is a threat. Just like if I pull out a switchblade and say, give me your car keys and you won't die. What I'm saying is I'm going to kill you unless you do what I say. So sometimes Eve is portrayed by some interpreters as kind of an airhead and like, oh, I got tricked. I'm really dumb. But I don't know if that's true, right? Maybe Eve felt that her life was on the line. And if that were true, then it makes the fall seem much more easily understood. I mean, would I do the right thing under threat of death? If somebody came along and said, hey, I want you to do this evil thing, otherwise I'll kill you. You won't die if you do what I'm telling you. Would I do the right thing? I hope I would, but I'm not sure I would. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the serpent, in a weird way, tells the truth, right? You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And that is clever, to, in a way, mislead people through saying something that's kind of true. Now, they're not really like God, knowing good and evil, because God's knowledge is creative. God doesn't know the way we know. When I know that water's here, I'm receptive to that, and I'm open to that, and my eyes... But God's knowledge is creative. So if you knew, like God knows, that would be to create good and evil. So I'd decide for myself whether murdering someone's wrong. I'm my own boss. If I feel like murdering somebody, well, it's right for me. So you see how the sin is, in a way, not so original. I mean, isn't that what everyone does when they, when they do wrong, or virtually everyone? They say, well, I decide, and I think it's right for me to do X, Y, and Z. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. Yeah, so think about, about the tree. It looks good for food. It appeals to our, our uh, bodily instincts, you might say. And it's a delight to the eyes. It looks good. It's going to make me very prestigious. I'm going to be really cool if I get this. And it's desire to make one wise. Well, it's good to be wise, right? What's happening here? I would say it's a classic case of rationalization, right? Which we all do, right? Before we do something bad, we don't say, this is totally bad. This is the worst thing ever. I'm doing it. Well, no, we rationalize, <laughs> right? We tell ourselves a little story. Well, that's not that bad, and it's good in this way, and we talk ourselves into this little thing, and then we do it, right? That's what Eve's doing. She took of its fruit and ate. So she takes the fruit and she eats and then? And she also gave some to her husband and he ate. And this is also very classic. Sometimes people think the private sins they do will remain private. No, not always, not typically. The good we do typically doesn't remain private either. When we really are filled with love of God and love of neighbor, it spills out. And when we're not, that spills out too. And the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. The eyes of both were opened. Well, we're not talking here, obviously, about physical eyesight, because it said just a couple of verses earlier, Eve saw the tree was good for food. So her eyes, physical eyes were working. But what does it mean their eyes were opened? Well, I think Jordan Peterson has a good insight here where that verse he understands to mean that they came to self-consciousness, they came to self-awareness, and they knew they were naked. Right? They weren't like little children, you know, three-year-olds, two-year-olds, whatever, running around. They realized they were naked, and they were vulnerable. And they realized that maybe I can't trust this other person. Maybe Eve was thinking, maybe I can't really trust Adam anymore. And Adam maybe was thinking the same thing. Maybe I should cover up. I'm kind of vulnerable here, out here naked. I need to, I need to camouflage myself. I need to hide. So what do they do? And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Yeah. They had to cover up from each other. They could no longer were in perfect harmony. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So this, too, is absolutely classic. When people do things that are wrong, they hide from God or try to hide from God. 
Now, you can't really hide from God, so it's, it's uh, you know, impossible to really do, but that's what they want to do. They want to hide from God, and very often they want to hide from other people. Not too many people get on social media and post, just want to let you guys know I cheated on my taxes, right? Just want to let everybody know I cheated on my wife. I mean, right? I, very few people do that, right? When we do things that are wrong, we hide, and we try to hide from God, and that's what the man and his wife do too to the man and said to him, where are you? So let me get this straight. God makes the heavens and the earth. He creates everything. He's rational. And yet he can't figure out where Adam is? Really? So God is all-knowing, omniscient, and he can't figure out where Adam is. That's hard to believe. Maybe God's question here isn't so much seeking information for God's understanding, but maybe this is helping Adam hopefully get to get some more information. I mean, think about a mom who comes across a kid who's got cookie crumbs all over his face, chocolate cookie crumbs, and say, hey, Johnny, did you get into the cookie jar? Now, is she asking for information? No, she knows he did. It's obvious there's cookies all over his face. But why does she do that? She does it because Johnny disrupted their relationship by disobeying her and getting in the cookies, and she's trying to give Johnny a chance to restore the relationship by being honest, by confessing what he did wrong, and thereby going some steps to restoring the harmony that did exist before he got into the cookies. And he said, I heard the sound of thee in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Mm -hmm. So Adam hides from God. Of course, it doesn't work. And that's a good lesson for us. There is no hiding from God right? I mean, the Psalms talk about this. You can go into the desert. God is still there. Why? Why is there no hiding from God? Because you are made in God's image. And so God isn't outside of you that you can hide from. God is also inside of you, right? And again, these metaphors are just metaphors because God is not bodily. So God isn't inside of you the way water is inside of you or outside of you the way the water is outside of me. But I think you understand what I'm saying. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? All right, so what does God do again? He's not asking for information, I don't think, right? He is trying to elicit a confession from Adam, right? He's saying, you might say to Adam, it's time for you to be honest with me, right? Just as the mother might say, Johnny, okay, I asked you once, I want you to be honest with me. Did you get into the cookies? Let's be real here. Let's, let's not stop lying. Let's start, stop evading my, our relationship. Let's talk to me. Let's be honest. Let's be real. Because being honest and real with someone is a path to reconciliation. Isn't that why an honest apology is a way to restore a relationship? If you go to someone and you say, I am really sorry for doing that. I, I had a horrible night's sleep and I was just out of it and I, I said that and I didn't mean that I, I apologize. That goes a long way to restoring the relationship. So God here is trying to, you might say, nudge Adam into freely coming back to him, to freely confessing what he did wrong. And so Adam, thank goodness, says, yes, Lord, I am so sorry. I sinned. I did a terrible thing. I apologize. It's my fault. I should have listened. No, no, that's not what he said. What did he say? The man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate it. Yep. So what does Adam do? He does the oldest trick in the book. He starts blaming other people, right? The woman, it's her fault. It's not my fault. It's her fault. And then, the, God, it's your fault too, right? You gave me the woman, and she got me in trouble. It's all your fault, God. It's all her fault. So he does not take responsibility, Right? He passes the buck. He passes the blame. And again, this is a story that literally could have been in yesterday's newspaper. Right? How many politicians, when they're caught doing whatever, start pointing fingers and blaming and, oh, no, it wasn't my fault. I was, you know, you know, I was holding my breath during that photo. It's not really my fault. And, you know, the mask, on, the mask was on my hand. And it's not really my fault. I, I didn't really do anything wrong. I mean, again, this is completely classic human behavior. And that is why I think this story of Genesis is such a classic story, because it's telling us truths that are as true now as the very first day they were written in Genesis. 
these are, you might say, perennial truths about the human condition, right? About the nature of the universe as orderly, about the nature of the human person as a combination of matter and spirit, about the nature of us as sometimes in harmony with other people, but then when we sin, out of harmony with other people. The nature of us when we try to flee from God and refuse to confess. The nature of God is chasing us down and going to us when we're trying to hide and still nudging us and urging us to come back. This story is as fresh and new and accurate as it ever was because it tells us truths about the human condition that are truths that are needed for today. And so that's why I am very happy to talk about the story of Genesis with my students because hopefully I can move them out of a misreading of Genesis as if it's a, you know, a bad science text, but into a proper reading and appreciation of Genesis as telling us incredibly important truths about ourselves, about the universe, and also about God. Thank you. Is this thing on? Hey. Uh, I was especially moved by the, when you were speaking about the Sabbath as covenant, and then you paired that with uh, Thomas's third way of contingency. Um, it strikes me that modern man is really kind of obsessed with self-creation and really despises his own contingency and poverty. How can we help in our evangelization and in our <clears throat> proper teaching of Genesis to help people see that their poverty is something in which they ought to rejoice. Yeah, I think, you, I think that's a really good point. It's a gift that we're created the way we are. And that's a really, really good thing. And I think people might begin to think about it and be, be helped by thinking about the gift of the human body. That is to say that creation is good. It's good you're made the way you're made. And it's good that, um, what would you say? Recognizing that goodness allows us to really flourish. I mean, if I don't recognize the created nature of my body, and I don't recognize that, say, certain foods are good for me to eat, and drinking motor oil is not good for me, well, I'm going to tend to injure myself, and maybe even injure others, through a misunderstanding about the created reality of who we are. And I do think there's a sense in which we can self-create. So what I mean is, yes, we are given uh, our soul and our body by God. And yes, God also gives us a vocation. But it also is true that God cooperates with our own freedom. So that's part, I think, the relationship with God is really unique to me. And your own relationship with God really is, in a certain way, unique to you. And that's the way it should be. God doesn't love us like, I don't know, the manager of an assembly plant, you know, just looks at a bunch of people, you know, random, arbitrary, unknown, faceless, not even really individual people that are like cogs that can just be replaced. Well, no, we're not cogs that can be replaced. Again, it'd be more like a family, right? If you die, your mother's not like, oh, well, you've, I've got other kids, so what? <laughs> of course not, right? You matter to your mom. And we matter individually, uniquely to God. And so there is a sense in which our own path is unique, and there's a creativity involved in that, right? I, if I'm going to serve God well, need to be creative and think, okay, well, what is the best use of my time? How can I really best serve God? And my way may be different than your way, and there's something totally fine about that. But there's a sense of self-creation that isn't fine when you think, well, I run the universe, and I'm going to make up the, the basic rules of morality for myself. And for me, again, whatever, murder is not wrong. Maybe it's wrong for you, but not for me. With that kind of relativistic thinking, that is really the antithesis of love. So that's very problematic creativity, you might say. Yeah. Uh, so thinking about uh, Jordan Peterson, when he's doing his uh, lectures, he talks about approaching them uh, as if they have something to offer. Yeah. You know, it talks about the perennial truths that, you know, this these collection of books have been around for 2,000 years, so so maybe, just maybe, there's 
something there for us to glean from it. Um, but then recently, maybe, maybe you remember the quote better, um, but he said something to the effect of saying that scripture is not true, that it's it's so true that it it's like, it's more fundamental than that. So to call it true is almost like uh, uh, give it a misnomer. Um, and so I was wondering, you know, I've never heard something like that said from within the church. And I was wondering, do you think we've lost uh, our, uh, as Catholics, like our command over scripture? I'm not sure if that's the best word, but um, do you think we've lost that? And and I know that, you know, like Word on Fire, they put out uh, like the Gospels uh, that, that includes a lot of beauty, as we were talking about. Um, but if we've lost it, how do, how do we go about trying to regain the sense of command over Scripture, uh, over the Word of God? Yeah, yeah, I, th- I think it's super important. Um, scripture, as Vatican II talks about, is uh, the soul of theology. So if we're going to do theology, which all of us, in some sense, need to do, if we're going to talk to people about God, I mean, theology just is the study of God. But if Scripture is the soul of that, it seems to me, yeah, you need to know Scripture. Now, how does that take place? Well, th- I think there are a number of ways that, that we can go about that, but, but I don't think there's any... I think it's absolutely indispensable to actually spend time reading and trying to appropriate and meditate on the Gospels. And there's different ways of doing that. Um, I think all Scripture is important, but the Gospels have a particular priority because the Gospels are about, about Christ. And how do you do that? Well, one recommendation that I find very helpful is to read a passage from the Gospels every single day. And luckily in the church, we're really lucky because every single day there's a reading from Mass, and so you can read along with who knows how many people around the world, that gospel passage. And then there's different ways to approach things. So one way to approach things is uh, after the manner recommended by St. Ignatius Loyola, that you read the passage from the gospels and you think about how you imagine yourself in the scene in some way, right? So today's gospel talked about um, the woman who asked Jesus to cure the daughter that had a demon. And uh, Jesus, uh, you know, does follows her command. So you could imagine yourself as that woman who's asking Jesus for a favor. You could imagine that you're some bystander there. You could imagine yourself as the daughter who's in need of healing, and your mom goes out and tries to help you and prays to Jesus for you. And I think that is, the, in fact, the situation of many of us. I mean, how many of our mothers literally every day pray to God for us? I know my mom does. I bet many of your moms do, right? I pray for my kids every single day. And so by putting yourself in that scene, you might connect what's happening in the gospel passage with your own life, with your own experience, and let it inform who you are. Because in a way, that kind of understanding of Scripture is more important than a mere abstract knowledge of Scripture or something. In other words, I would rather have somebody know the gospels in that way than merely to know academic truths about the Gospels. Like, oh, this was dated to the year 90 and, you know, this and that. I mean, that, I'm not denying that's important. That is important. But I think even more important is, you might say, a personal appropriation of these stories such that they inform who you are and they inform your understanding of who God is. That, I think, is more important. Again, not to deny the importance of the other. The other is also important. But even more important, I think, is this personal appropriation. But I think that happens day by day. And that's part of the beauty, I think, of having these gospel readings throughout the years. Because if you do it every day, you're going to read over the same passage again and again. But you reading it now is going to be different than you reading it 10 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now. Right? It'll be different. And hopefully it'll be deeper. Because hopefully over that time, your love for God is even deeper. You're even more committed. You're even more in love. And therefore, you have an even greater understanding, in some sense, of what the gospel is trying to teach us. Because if Augustine's right, the whole point of the Bible is to teach us to love God more and to love our neighbor more. And that is definitely something that we can grow in week by week, month by month, year by year, decade by decade. I mean, hopefully at the end of our lives, we're great saints. And people say, this person's totally amazing. Wow, they really were able to help so many people, right? Right? But I think that's not by accident. I think that happens when someone is open to God's grace day after day and it develops and matures and grows, again, on and on and on in a really unlimitless way.
very much. Um, I, uh, I had a question about the, when you talked about kind of right the moment of original sin when um, Eve, I guess, and Jordan Peterson said that it's the moment of like self-consciousness, I guess. Um, I was curious if you could speak more into uh, to, to kind of that, that quote from Jordan Peterson and just kind of like if he distinguishes or talks about uh, the kind of the other moments that we see of Adam and Eve's consciousness, right, where maybe Adam's like where he recognizes that he's different than all the other, um, the, the rest of creation, or just even that moment where he sees uh, Eve and is like, wow, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, just, I'm just curious to kind of see like if he talks about or if you could talk about just kind of those different moments of, of self-consciousness. Um, so thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So I, th I think self-consciousness kind of comes in degrees. So I don't think it's just you have it or you don't because you can be more or less self-conscious, more or less aware of who you are. So part of, at least Socrates thought, part of wisdom was growing in self-knowledge, right? One of the great Socratic dictums is know thyself. So what does that mean? Well, obviously we all know ourselves to a degree, right? We know our birthday and we know who our parents are and things like that. But in a way, we still are mysteries to ourselves. For instance, to know the motivations behind your actions often take some digging and really careful thought and consideration. And to know, for instance, what you really want and what really would bring you fulfillment also often takes some digging and some careful discernment. So there's very often a gap between what we think will make us happy on the one hand, what actually will make us happy in the other. So when you talk about the self-consciousness in the story of Genesis, it seems to me it, it kind of comes in degrees. So there is a kind of primitive self-consciousness before the line that you talked about. So you're right, when Adam's looking at the, at the animals, well, he obviously is he's aware of things, because otherwise how could he differentiate the different animals? Right? So he has awareness. But is it self-consciousness in a, in a fuller sense? I don't think so. So to be self-conscious in a more full sense, it seems to me, is coming to what sometimes is called the age of reason, right? So you might think of it this way. Little children are kind of a little bit acting on instinct. They just kind of do stuff, right? If they're hungry, they eat, and they just kind of move around and do stuff. And then once you come to the age of reason, you can be more self-reflective. And there's some, a bigger gap between, say, your in, impulses or instincts on the one hand, what you choose to do. So only at that point can you say that you really are able to take responsibility for your actions. And that's why, for instance, little children are never uh, convicted of crimes, right? If a three-year-old kills someone, you don't have a trial and put the three-year-old on trial, right? You say, oh, that's a terrible accident, it's too bad. But only when a child is older do we recognize that a child can begin to be held responsible for doing some bad activity. But even there, there's a little bit of a gradation, right? Because if a child, let's say, of 12 kills someone, we do hold them responsible to a degree, but not the way we would hold a 24-year-old who killed someone, right? So there's this sort of gradation. But part of that, I think, has to do with self-consciousness, because if you're not really self-conscious, I think it's pretty hard to be held responsible for things, right? You need that in order to be held responsible for things. So I think the text in Genesis is talking about the arrival of self-conscious awareness that leads to a real responsibility for what you're doing. Dr. Kayser, uh, at the beginning of this lecture, you noted that Genesis is largely a response to other ancient Near Eastern creation myths, like the Enuma Elish uh, myths that uh, are very violent, uh, with strife seems to undergird creation. Uh, and, and it seems to me that we have uh, perhaps similar creation myths nowadays. You think about uh, Marxism in all of its iterations, uh, evolution, capitalism, uh, I mean, I, I think for all the scientific and philosophical merits of these philosophies, uh, we work out of caricatures of them and, uh, and largely consider uh, the basic premise of life, history to be violence, competition, strife. And I, I think that's very evident in the, uh, the polarization we see nowadays. So how would you practically suggest recapturing the truths of Genesis as a response to a lot of these 
ideologies and uh, and competitive uh, uh, philosophies, these these uh, modern creation myths, if you mm-hmm. will. Yeah, I, I like the idea that that myths or origin stories are kind of a recurring pattern in human life. So you do have the ancient ones like the Babylonian and Greek and stuff like that. But I think you're right. You do have a kind of kind of modern versions of those things. Um, and how do you connect those up with Genesis? It's a good question. So I guess one thing I might say is that many people hold ultimately conflicting stories about things. So for instance, many people hold, yes, all human beings have basic value and dignity, which ultimately I think does arrive from the Genesis story. But then they also hold that somehow human beings are innately at each other's throats and innately in competition. Now, is that really opposed to the Genesis story? Uh, Arguably not, because we didn't talk about this, but as you read, as you know, further in the story, you have, for instance, Cain and Abel. And so that story seems to point to a real fundamental competition, violence, strife. And and that story, too, points to the consequences that come from a disharmony and disunity with God, right? You have brother literally killing brother. And that sort of story also, I think, points to the myth that if we just had, you know, equality of classes, if we just had equality of races, if we just had this kind of equality or that kind of equality, that our problems would go away. I don't think so, because you see in families that are the same race, same economic well-being, same everything, many times where brother hates brother, right? The, the story of Cain and Abel is found in almost every family, right? This cousin hates that cousin. This sister hates that sister. This mother-in-law and this daughter-in-law are not. I mean, this is like literally universal, right? So I think the story of Genesis is, uh, you might say, the more universal story, the more the deeper story, um, yeah, than, than some of these other stories, I guess. But then, then part of me also wants to say, you don't want to just get into rival storytelling mode and say, well, let the best story win. Why? Well, because I think if you're a clever storyteller and you've got a big box, a big budget for your movie and you hire actors, you can make actually a false story seem pretty engaging and entertaining. So I'm not sure that... that rival stories is the best way to think about it because you can make a a really fundamentally false story pretty attractive. Um, I think in a way to answer uh, the philosophical question about what's true, it requires to go beyond story, beyond narrative into philosophy. So for instance, with Marxism, what I would say for instance is, what evidence do you have that all that exists is matter? Right? Why should I think that? What evidence do you have that there is no God. What's wrong with these arguments I'm giving you for God's existence? So it seems to me I would want to engage not so much in the story aspect of it, but in a more philosophical, metaphysical kind of argument that, okay, well, let's talk about, you know, your account of things. So for instance, the Marxist idea that all conflict arises because of this, um, you know, capitalism and all that, it seems to me that's a preposterous story taken in light of history as if before capitalism arose, there was no violence or something. This is completely wrong. I mean, obviously wrong. So that story, it seems to me, is is not very possible. Or the idea that, I'll stop. I was about to go on a big anti-communist rant, but I'll just just hold off. I can't, I can't, okay. Anti-communist rant, no. Um, Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Hello. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry, Tom. I'll be quick. Um, uh, <laughs> um, you, you said at the beginning about how Genesis has no more to say about evolution than it does about whether I should buy an iPhone or not. And um, But you also said... Um, uh, you also said uh, that the creation, story of the creation of Eve from Adam's rib uh, is is important in, in teaching us the unity of the human race, um, and um, and you gave uh, you 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 drew attention to the fact that St Thomas's argument for the existence of God is not to do with temporality but to do with the current dependence for its existence of created things on something infinite and uncreated. Um, and St. Thomas makes a, a, a big deal out of the fact that 
uh, that the universe has a finite beginning in time is a truth of revelation rather than a truth of reason. Um, so, I mean, it seems as if certain truths about human origins and about cosmic origins, like, for example, the finite beginning of the universe and monogenism, are truths which are a substantive historical truths in a certain sense, um, taught by Genesis and which the church derives from Genesis. So how are there are there some truths of this nature contained in the biblical narrative? And how do we tell which things are substantive rather than anthropological, as it were, um, and which aren't? And yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that's an ongoing discussion um, in the church as to how to best read Genesis. As, as I indicated at the beginning, there are actually all kinds of different ways of reading Genesis in the tr Catholic tradition. So unlike some Protestant traditions that insist that everyone in their congregation or whatever understand Genesis in this way and only this way, among Catholics there's actually quite a bit of latitude, even canonized saints that disagree with each other about how to read Genesis. So to give just one example, St. Ambrose and St. Augustine disagreed about the proper interpretation of Genesis. And they're both canonized saints and both fathers of the church. So there is a kind of latitude within um, the Catholic tradition for how to read these stories. So how do you determine what is, you might say, uh, literally true on the one hand for what is more poetic on the other hand? And I guess what I'd say is that I gave you my own reading of that, and that's how I take it. So, for instance, when it says God made Adam from the dust of the earth and breathed into him the breath of life, like I take that as a beautiful poetic way of saying that what we are as human beings is a combination of matter and spirit, of body and soul. Now, maybe that's wrong. Maybe that's a bad, read of reading, bad way of reading Genesis. I'm open to being corrected. But for me, I interpret that in a, in a way that it is a beautiful poetic way of making this point, not as that God actually used dust and actually breathed into... I mean, I, I, don't, I don't take it in that kind of literalistic, wooden sort of way. So I do think it's true. I think it's teaching us very important points that are relevant to reality, but I don't take it in... in yeah, I take it, I take it as poetry expressing an important truth. So here's one way to think of it. If you read poetry, I think poetry really does teach us extremely important truths but it conveys it in a kind of poetic way. And so if, for instance, I'm reading Shakespeare, and it says, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's leaves hath all too short a date. And then I go to the almanac, the weather almanac, and I check out the, the weather in May, and I learn that there's not rough winds in May. Well, I think I'm just reading Shakespeare in a really unintelligent way, because I don't think Shakespeare really was trying to tell me about the weather. The point of, this, of the poem is not really that. But I think the poem really is teaching us important things. So Pius XII talked about this, and John Paul II did too, that in the story of Genesis, there are definitely truths about the nature of the human person. For instance, as this unity of body and soul. But that there's also poetic language that is telling us important truths, but in a kind of poetic way. And so exactly how to differentiate, well, what parts are poetic and what parts are non-poetic, you might say, um, there's an openness in the Catholic tradition for different kinds of interpretations. So I don't really have a rule, though, for you to say, well, here's the rule by which you determine how, you know, what parts are more poetic and what parts are more everyday you know, uh, ways of speaking. Um, so I'm not aware. I don't have a rule in my mind that I'm withholding from you. I, don't, I just don't have a rule that differentiates those texts. And that may be a weakness in my reading of Genesis. Maybe there is a rule that could help us differentiate these, you know, these different readings of, of Genesis. But I do think it's a misreading of Genesis to seek a kind of, what would you say? I want to say a wooden literalism or simplistic literalism that ignores or downplays or fails to recognize the poetic nature of the text. Because I do think it is, you know, it is poetry. But again, true poetry. So I, I'm not saying it's, it's myth in the sense of just stuff made up and has no connection to reality. It's true, but it's expressing truths in an imagistic, poetic sort of way, at least in parts, in my view. Yeah, I wanted to come back to uh, 
self-consciousness. Yeah. Just because um, sometimes self-consciousness in the context of the Adam and Eve story is used um, just sometimes. So sometimes a, a kind of origins myth is told drawing upon evolution that this is actually a kind of ascent mm -hmm. to self-consciousness. Right. right. And so the whole thing, that kind of is seen as an attainment, a kind of human evolutionary attainment and a kind of elevation. Yeah. Whether that fits well with evolutionary theory is a kind of secondary question, but that's sort of the mythology that uses the theory. But the Genesis story is a story about a fall. And so in some sense, the self-consciousness that arises here is from a, a kind of downward movement. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems plausible to me that Adam and Eve, in some sense, may have been much less self-aware after the eating of the apple or after, after the fall than they were before. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult for me to sort of tease out because we sometimes use the word self-consciousness in very different ways. Like when somebody's really self-conscious and they're sort right. of, you know, especially of teenagers or, or, or certain personality types like myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and other times we use it in terms of a full reflective understanding and this sort of ability of the human intellect to reflect on itself, which seems almost a kind of the basis for arguing for the spirituality and incorruptibility of the soul. So I, I would kind of want to press that a little bit in terms of when Jordan says that, whose myth is he appealing to now, and are we conflating different different sorts of myths? It's, yeah. It's, that's the best I kind of put the question. Yeah, thanks, thanks. I like that question a lot. So it seems before the fall, before the serpent, Adam has a kind of reasoning ability that goes beyond just an animal reasoning ability. And the reason I think that is he's, he's categorizing the animals. But to categorize things and label them seems to involve a kind of universalizing. That is to say, this is the kind of thing I call a zebra. This is also a kind of thing I call a zebra. This is the kind of thing I call a, you know, a tiger or whatever. So that kind of categorization, it seems to me, involves a distinctly human use of reason where you're going beyond, uh, you know, just sense perceptions, but you're, you're actually dividing up, you might say, different kinds of things, different kinds of animals into different kinds of categories. And then it also, even before the fall, involves a self-consciousness, right? Because he recognizes, well, I don't find among all these creatures I've looked at anything that's really a partner for me. So he must be aware of who he is in some sense. So, so, so there is self-consciousness for sure in that sense. So what happens after the fall? Well, it says that they were aware that they were naked. And that seems indicative of what? Well, to be aware you're naked involves kind of, yeah, a kind of self-consciousness in the teenager sense, right? That you're sort of awkward and you want to cover up and you want to wear a hat and it's a bad hair day, so I'm going to put on the hat. And you sort of, you know, that you sense a vulnerability you sense a lack, you sense an imperfection in yourself, and therefore you want to hide things, right? Like think of sometimes when someone puts on a dress, you know, and does this make me look fat, right? Because you want to cover things up, you want to look, you know, the right way. Um, so that sort of is indicative, and that sense of self-consciousness could only arise after some sort of fall, I think, right? So, for instance, the self-consciousness of sin, the self-consciousness that makes you want to hide from somebody else or from God. All that is, is a new kind of self-consciousness that seem, seems like didn't exist before in the text. So, yeah, arguably there is some kinds of self-consciousness before, but then a new kind that only arises after. Sure. I think you need the microphone, though, if you want people online to hear you. Is the knowledge of good and evil and of sin crucial to that kind of self-consciousness? And would there be a way of coming to know God, good and evil that would avoid that kind of negative self-consciousness? Yeah, and definitely. How do you yeah, so God's knowledge of good and evil avoids that. And the knowledge of good and evil that the good angels have that didn't fall avoids that. And Adam and Eve, in some sense, knew good and evil before. 
because they knew it was good not to eat the, of the fruit and evil to eat of the fruit. So there is a kind of knowledge of good and evil before. But the difference, I guess, is the eating of the fruit is a way of symbolizing, you might say, uh, trying to create good and evil for yourself. And that kind of thing was new. And that's, you know, that's, that's what happened here, I think, at least arguably. So much. Sure. Thank you for that question, Tom. Um, that was my question, too. Um, so it seems to me that in terms of the, whether or not this is an ascent, I mean, clearly it's uh, the truth that's being told to us is that it, this is a descent, right? This is a fall. But it's, and what the, that the new awareness is of our own capacity to be um, out of harmony with God and with each other, right? Um, so it's, it's, you know something that you didn't know before, um, but in that, I mean, I, I, I just think it's very interesting because the, the problem with Peterson's interpretation is that um, it's, it, um, Adam and Eve are simply incomplete without this, right? Um, and so um, God really is hiding something from them, right, <laughs> by, by keeping um, them from this. So just the whole question of what does it really mean to be innocent um, and, and what kind of awareness does somebody have to have? Because obviously we wouldn't want to say that the sort of responsibility for one's actions only happens after the fall because then they wouldn't be responsible for the fall. Right, right. Right? So, so yeah, anyway. It was good Tom asked the question because he did it much more coherently. But, 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 I, but I, it, it just seems to me it's a very interesting kind of conundrum that what, what Adam and Eve learn is that they have a potency to be out of union with God. And they didn't know that before. Um, but they already had the potency, right? But now that they've actualized it, now they know about it, right? We only know about yeah. the potential through the actual. Um, and it, but what an interesting thing for them to discover. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe this distinction from Aquinas might help the discussion. Um, so Thomas, as you, as you may know, talks about a distinction between verum ut verum. Uh, no, sorry, sorry. Malum ut malum and malum ut verum. So the distinction is this, that the evildoer, let's say a killer, knows evil as evil. That is to say, he knows the evil as a perpetrator of the evil. But it's possible to know evil as true. So that would be like the detective who knows all about the crime and, you know, has all the evidence and really knows maybe more about the crime in some ways than the criminal does because he's counted the stab wounds. He knows every, you know, everything about the crime. But he doesn't know evil as the evildoer through his experience of doing evil. He knows the evil as true. So you might say that Adam and Eve did have a knowledge of evil before becoming perpetrators, but they gained knowledge of evil as evil only after they perpetrated the evil. But they had knowledge of evil as true before the perpetration of the evil. Any other questions? Doctor, let's say, hypothetically, some crazy kid was studying for an STB and needed to write a thesis in, like, two or three years. Uh, <laughs> hypothetically. Okay. Uh, what questions in Genesis do you have that might be interesting to explore? What questions about Genesis do I have? Um, well, every time I go over this text, in a way, there are new things that I think about and new things I discover. What would be the... Okay, so here's one thing that I, I don't really understand very well at all. And actually, you probably noticed I stopped telling the story at a certain point. Um, and it's not just because we ran out of time. But I don't understand very well at all the different punishments. Like, I don't really, I kind of get Adam's, I guess, a little better, but I don't really get Eve's punishments. Like, what are we to make of that, right? Where it says that, you know, because you sin, now you're going to go through the pain of childbirth and this and that. 
Now, it is true that many animals don't go through uh, painful childbirth, um, and human beings do. And the reason human beings do is that there's a cephalopelvic disproportion. That basically means that the baby's head is, is so large that it's hard to exit the birth canal. But then if babies are born earlier than that, then basically their lungs aren't developed enough to breathe. So they have to stay in utero long enough to have their lungs develop. But then if they do that, then their head is so big that it's hard to exit the birth canal. So, so we have painful childbirth. But somehow the text of Genesis connects this up, and it's connected to women, obviously not men, since women only give birth. So I just don't know what quite to make of that. And I, yeah, I don't know. I, I have, so that's a question I have about the punishments that are involved there. Um, another question I have, let me think. Um, hmm. hmm. Oh, at the end, there's the angel with the flaming sword keeping them out from going back in the Garden of Paradise. And that's just kind of weird, too. Like, you need an angel there to keep things out? That seems kind of weird. So I guess for me, there are... There are an infinite number of questions in a way for the text of Genesis and also a virtually infinite number of questions for the Catholic tradition. And the reason I say that is that if you have a belief in something, that is not the end of questioning. But at least if you're a person who asks questions, that's really the beginning of questioning. So if you believe God exists, well, then you can start asking all kinds of interesting questions like, well, how is God's freedom related to my freedom? Or how is God's foreknowledge related to my freedom, right? If you read Genesis in a serious sort of way, well, that, again, gives rise to certain beliefs, which, again, gives rise to certain uh, questions. Um, another interesting question that I have been thinking about and I don't really have a great answer for that is pursued in a recent book by William Lane Craig called The Historical Adam is thinking about the question of, uh, you know, the historical Adam. So in one way, I want to say, look, there had to be, an atom. And the reason there has to be an atom is that however many creatures might have existed before the first human being, uh, there has to be some kind of something that differentiates, say, pre human beings from human beings. And what exactly is that? Well, maybe it's speech. Maybe it's the ability to categorize things, right? Maybe it's the ability to universalize and make these kinds of judgments so you can categorize things and move beyond sense perception. So, even if you purely accept a purely evolutionary story, there has to be somebody who, as it were, crosses the finish line first. It is the very first person to use rational speech or the very first person to be able to conceptualize or however you want to think of uh, the first uh, human being. But then that raises questions about, well, how does that relate to the rest of human beings on Earth? So there's a Dominican who's written a series of articles on Genesis and evolution. And so his work I find really fascinating. His work I don't really understand that well. So if I knew of someone who were writing a thesis about something like that, I would look into his work. And his name, I think, is Ostranico. Yeah, can you say that louder? Father Nicanor Ostrianco. Yeah, that's right. So he's written like... Th oh. All right. <laughs> All right, so I'll let her have the final word. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kishore. It's been a, a joy, and you have spent the whole day here with lots of questions, and probably after we finish some more questions will come. But let us uh, finish with a prayer. Thank you. It's been a, a whole day together. We were looking forward to this since, I think, 2019, right? Three years growing in the expectations. And when you came here, you didn't say just, nice to meet you, Holy Father. But, <laughs> but it was uh, very interesting for all of us in the morning with Jordan Peterson, God and Christianity, and, and now with Genesis 1 and 2. Um, with this beautiful explanation, uh, sentence by sentence, of uh, the beginning, uh, the beginning of creation, and the beginning of of 
of our of our path with the Lord. So let us finish. You mentioned Saint Ignatius of Loyola. So you teach there at Loyola every month. So you do this for the greater glory of God at majoring the glory. And let us finish praying a glory be in gratitude to the to the Lord. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Spirit as, as it was, was in the beginning, beginning is now, now and ever shall, shall be world without, without end. end. Saint John Vianney, pray yes, for yes. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you.